Uh, so today, day two of National Raw Feeding Week. Hey, JJ. And today we're going to be talking about raw feeding mar marvels, <laughs> models. We're going to be talking about raw feeding models. So um, as I said in the first video, it's been seven years this month that I've been feeding my dogs a raw food diet. It's been six years that I've been writing about it on Keep the Tail Wagging. And it basically just completely changed my life. It changed the lives of my dogs. And I love it. I love raw feeding. I love writing about it. I love talking about it. I love everything about it. And today we're going to talk about raw feeding models. And I think that this topic is so fascinating simply because um, we have gone from when I first started basically two models kind of like four, but I'll explain that in a second, to a long, I have, I was making a list of models. These are all the models right here, so many. And I know that this isn't an exclusive list. So um, let's just say, when I first started, there was Whole Prey and there was Barf Model. So Whole Prey Model was the 80-10-10 model. And it was the model, as I understood it, that most closely um, resembled what a wild canine or a wolf would eat out in the wild. And so they would look at what a prey animal was kind of made up of, 80% muscle meat, 10% bone, 10% organ meat, 50% of which was liver. Um, and by organ meat, it was secreting organs because as we've learned, there are certain organs that humans deem as organs, but in a raw food diet, it's treated as muscle meat, one example, or two, heart and uterus are fed as muscle meat. I don't know about uterus. I always forget. So correct me if I'm wrong on uterus. So anyway, so that was like the model and you would see pictures of dogs eating like a hog's head or a deer's foot um, or leg or something like that. You know, it was whole prey. It was serious, you know, a dog eating a rabbit hole with the fur and everything. And to someone who's new to raw feeding, it was just like, oh, I don't want to do that. And if you have a partner, who is not keen on you switching the dogs to a raw food diet, telling him that you're gonna throw the carcass of an animal out in the yard and let the dogs go at it, not really gonna go over very well. So the other option is a BARF model. So BARF had two acronyms, um, Biologically Appropriate Raw Food or Bones in Raw Food. So, um, you know, it's unfortunate barf model, everyone giggle, 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 you know, it's such a stupid name. Um, and, but that was the model that was um, similar, but it added a little bit more. So the difference between barf and whole prey was that barf generally was ground. It could be whole, but it was generally ground. It had vegetables in it and it added supplements to it. So that was sort of like the basic explanation of those two models. And of course, as people start feeding their dogs, and this is something that I didn't know seven years ago, but as people start feeding their dogs, they kind of adjust the diet that they follow and it turns more into a Franken prey or a Franken barf. And all that means is that I kind of just did my own thing. I started here, now I'm here, and it's kind of, you know, it's my own thing, whatever. So to me, um, I always thought that I fed and I still do feed a Franken barf diet. And to, what that means to me is that I take a little bit of everything. I take a little bit from whole prey. So I do like to give my dogs whole cuts of meat and bone because it's great for the chewing and the teeth um, and the mind. If, if you've ever watched a dog eating whole food, they kind of zone out. I mean, I've seen my dogs go from bouncing off the walls because I have a tray full of, um, duck carcasses or yeah and they are going their duck frames is what they're called but they're going crazy and i hand them out and everyone mellows out they're quiet and even after they're done they're just sort of like yeah and so there is benefit to whole prey um but i also believe that it's important for dogs to have vegetables um to me they're a source of fiber they feed the microbiome in the gut. They do add um, antioxidants, which um, fight the free radicals floating through the system um, that lead to cancer. Um, they also provide additional nutrients in the dog's diet. So there is benefit to um, vegetables. And then of course, supplements. For those things that your dog isn't getting in their diet, 
you add supplements to cover it. And so for example, if you look at an 80 10 10 diet or even an 80 10 10 plus vegetables, you're not going to have um, omega-3 fatty acids. So yeah, you can add fish, but if you don't have access to fish, um, you can add uh, an omega-3 fatty acid or salmon oil or fermented fish stock, but some type of supplement. It could be a whole food supplement, which is what fermented fish stock is, but it's a supplement nonetheless. So <clears throat> hopefully I'm not talking too fast, but that's basically what's going on with those two models. Um, so yay hey scott <laughs> i know i'm wearing the flannel just in honor of being in the pacific northwest being at home and it being a kind of a rainy day shout out to nate and um <clears throat> tj says uh just bought whole bunnies for the boys oh my gosh tj i want to get there so so bad if you think about it do me a fab babe, take video of your dogs eating the whole bunnies and shoot it over to me so that I can get some inspiration because it's actually cheaper. And I know I'm going off topic a little bit, but stay with me. It's actually cheaper in some cases to buy whole animals where if the per person that you're getting the food from the farm or whatever, doesn't have to process it further by grinding it and bagging it. If all they have to do is vacuum seal a whole animal and give it to you, sometimes they sell it to you for less. So it is a money saving thing. It's just that, you know, they're eating a bunny. And for some people you get that sort of heart tug and feel sad. That was me seven, six years ago. Today, I, I just, it's, na it's nature. I don't really worry too much about it. As long as they're not capturing a bunny in front of me and killing it and eating it, I'm good. Um, Janet says, afternoon from rainy Northern New York, walking the dogs as I listen. Yay, Janet, thank you so much. Hi, Diane. Um, okay. Hi, Stephanie. So, yay. Let's talk about the list of raw feeding models that I just showed you right here. So I'm going to go down. We have whole prey, which I mentioned. We have barf model, which I also mentioned and Franken, which is just an, an adjustment of both of those models or either model. Okay. There's hybrid diet. So a hybrid to me is basically feeding two different models together in one bowl or maybe different times of the day. So when I first started feeding raw, I fed raw in the morning, kibble in the evening. That was a hybrid diet. I've seen people who feed sometimes cooked, sometimes raw, um, sometimes canned food, sometimes raw, you know, whatever the case may be. It's just two different models together. Um, that's what I consider it. There's also a keto diet. So we all learned about the keto diet after um, or during the dog cancer series. Some people knew about it long before the dog cancer series, but the ketogenic diet is basically a diet that is high in fat, moderate protein, low in carbs. And the idea of it is that it starves the um, cancer cells. And the reason why you would wonder is like, well, why are you doing moderate protein? Don't dogs need it? Well, believe it or not, as the system is processing the protein, it does turn it into food for cancer cells. So that's why moderate protein and low carbs. And then the carbs that are fed are, you know, like, um, you know, greens type of, you know, or green beans or something, you know, low glycemic vegetables. And, um, and, but then high fat. So you can look at Answers Pet Food if you're looking for a keto diet. They have a keto diet. I believe that there are a couple of brands now, um, raw food brands that offer a keto diet. And um, I know Bones & Co is one of them. I can't remember the other one, but I've seen their ads. Um, and then of course, my friend Trish, who runs the page, Baby Steps to Healthier Pets, she has been feeding um, her dogs, or one of her dogs, I know, a keto diet. Does she just have one dog? She's been feeding her dog a keto diet and has extended her dog's life as a result. And I believe she herself has even done a keto diet too. So she is the person that I go to when I have questions about a keto diet. So, and there are great books online. Um, you can get them on Amazon about a keto diet. I would say that before jumping into a keto diet, really have a clear understanding of what you're trying to accomplish and really work with someone to make sure you're doing it right. I thought in the beginning that a keto diet was just basically feeding mostly fat. So you just threw in a stick of butter and a bunch of cream and things like that. No, that's just gonna make your dog fat. So you wanna make sure that you're doing it correctly. Um, there's a commercial diet. I could say that commercial diets are usually prey model or bark model, but for the most part, commercial diets have 
some of them have um, vitamin packs in them. Or is it a vitamin, vitamin mix in them in order for it to be balanced. So I can put it in its own little model. So people do feed pre-made or commercial raw. Um, there's the NRC. Uh, that's basically um, the science base of raw feeding that some people call it. And it's a legit way to feed your dogs. And people who do feed based on the NRC are looking at the NRC manual and they are feeding their dogs based on exact nutrients that their dogs need at a certain size or weight and also looking at the calories that are in their dog's diet. And um, I personally am not a fan of this model only because I don't think anyone has it right when it comes to balance. And I try to get away from using that word when um, I'm trying to feed my dogs. I try to stick with nutritious, but that's just me. But it is a legit way. And there are a lot of people who are feeding that way. Uh, then, of course, there's 80-10-10. Uh, yeah, I said that Prey model was 80-10-10, but for some people it's not. It's a separate model. Then there's 80-10-10 plus, which is basically adding additional foods to make that diet more nutritious. And then, of course, you can do a combo of mini models. It just depends on what you have in your freezer at the time. So, wow, we have a lot going on. We've grown a lot. We've learned a lot over the past seven years in this community, seeing all these different people doing different things. And that's the benefit to me of these amazing communities. Hey, Krista, of these amazing communities is that, you know, and by communities, I mean raw feeding groups, is that you get to learn so many things and see what other people are doing. And for me, it takes the pressure off. I don't feel like I have to do one single thing. I feel like I can be open to everyone's ideas and then take from that and do what's best for my dogs. So, um, Scott says, I think in a couple of years, we'll have left the models behind and moved towards meeting different needs. And you know what? I absolutely agree. And of course, you know, Diane, you hear me saying this all the time, feed the dog in front of you. And that is basically once someone told me that it, I feel like it freed me up to just do what was best for my dogs. I didn't have to listen to all these experts um, who are telling me what I'm supposed to be doing. I just need to do what's best for my dogs. And this is why in my blog, in my videos, everything that I do, I make sure to point out that I'm feeding my dogs and I'm talking about my dogs. And I am open to being wrong. I'm open to new information. And sometimes if someone gives me something they think I should be doing and it doesn't work for me, I'm open to saying, eh, that doesn't work for me or, oh, that's interesting, tell me more. I think that's how we should all be. Um, Stephanie says, agreed, I do my own hybrid base on how time of year and what is available. And you know what's so funny is that um, I should have said another thing, and I don't know if we would call this in a raw feeding model, but I know that it's a model for humans that I've learned about over the past few years, is people will eat what's in season. And this more goes to vegetables. And so for instance, um, if it's January, I am not eating cantaloupe because cantaloupe is not in season in January, despite the fact that we can buy it at the store. I am going to see when cantaloupe is typically in season for my area and that is when I'm going to eat it. And a lot of people will feed their dogs that same way. And so if they make a vegetable blend like I do, the vegetables that they choose for the blend will be appropriate to the time of the year and when those vegetables will be growing, if that makes sense. So yay, those are all the models. There's tons out there. You are welcome to choose what works for you, what works for your dog and switch it up. You can switch it up every other week. You can switch it up every week. You can switch it up every other day. Just do expose yourself to as much as possible so that you can ultimately choose what's right for your dog. So yay. Okay, so the next thing, uh, let's talk about just that, what works for you and what works for your pet. Wow, this is going pretty smoothly. Um, I always think about it as lifestyle, comfort level, sourcing, and information that you have on hand. So with the lifestyle, if you live in an apartment and you just have that little freezer ahead, maybe you're not going to want to feed whole prey because it won't fit very well in that freezer. It'll be easier for you to feed um, a ground diet. It can still be prey model. It's just that everything will be ground. I do know brands that offer prey model. Um, Vibrant Canine is one of them. And then you can take their food 
and add things to it to make it healthier. And I hope I'm correct. I know, I don't know if Krista still does prey model with her foods or if it's where she was. So I may be off base right there. You can also order like from certain sites, they will have a blend that is kind of an 80, 10, 10 blend, and then you can add things to it. So you can do a ground prey model diet. It's just for people who have a small apartment, that's what's gonna fit in the freezer, not a whole hog's head or a whole rabbit's. Um, also, if you live in an apartment, you might not have a place to feed your dogs a whole diet and your neighbors probably won't be happy with you doing it out on a lawn, you know, in front of your building. So that's another thing is that, you know, it might be easier just to do a ground diet in the bowl. Unless you want to lay out a tarp in your apartment, I guess you can do that too. So, um, but when it comes to what we do, for me, um, doing a ground uh, barf model di barf model ish diet is easier for me because I have a grinder. The ground food I can put it into containers. It stacks easily into the freezer. I keep everything organized. I know exactly what everything is. If you've seen my freezers, one thing that I've added that um, I'm just such a nerd about is everything is labeled, and I love it. Love having the labels in there, so I know exactly what I'm grabbing and pulling out. I don't, it's not a guessing game, but that's what works for me. Um, what is your comfort level? So if you're not the type of person who's okay with seeing your dog munch down on bunnies or um, a hog's head or a cow's head or whatever the case may be, then you may would prefer um, ground. You just really don't wanna see the face. And I completely understand that. It took me a long time to get past uh, dealing with whole prey model. And I think it was having a raw feeding group and having people share that stuff and being like, ah, and you know, delete, delete, delete. You know, I did that for a while, um, but I've gotten over it. And granted, I still don't like seeing people's poop pictures, not interested in what your dog's poop looks like. Um, but I don't mind the whole raw when people, it, to me, it's like, it gives me ideas of other things that I can feed to my dogs. Um, I'm not there yet. I still just do duck frames is probably the most whole raw that I do. But, um, you know, I'm not averse to it. If someone offered up and said, hey, I got this for you, I would be like, yes, thank you. Uh, the only problem that I have with whole raw with my dogs is eating it too fast, believe it or not. You would think that whole raw would make dogs eat it more slowly. With some foods, um, like Rodrigo will eat it so fast and then immediately vomit it back up. And so it's one of those things where ground works best for him. And so that's what everyone gets. Sourcing. So what do you have access to? Not everyone has access to whole bunnies or hogs heads. Um, not everyone has access to a lot of things. I am working on a blog post right now about feeding lungs to dogs because one of my followers asked me a question because that is something that she has access to by bucket loads. So um, I'm looking into the nutrient levels of beef lungs. But when it comes to um, choosing a model, it may come down to what you have access to. So for instance, you may be thinking, oh, I wanna do prey model, but you don't have access to fish to add in the omega-3 fatty acids. Maybe you don't have the budget for salmon oil or your dog is allergic to fish. And so you need to find something else. So you may want to go to more of a barf model or an 80, 10, 10 plus. And then finally, it's information and what you know. And I have found that I, ch wow, it's raining really hard right now. I found that um, when it comes to what I'm feeding my dogs, I change up how I'm feeding them and what I'm feeding them based on the information that I get and things that I learn. So if you are brand new to raw feeding today, I guarantee that five years from now, you will be doing something completely differently unless you're feeding pre-made the entire time because you just learn new things as you become more um, exposed to different ways of feeding our dogs and different issues to cover when you're feeding your dogs, you will just grow as a raw feeder. So, um, Scott, I learn from my group members constantly and do my best to never get static in my learning. I love that. If someone proved that kibble was best and raw was harmful, I'd switch. If someone told me dogs need 60% carbs and it was proved, I'd start doing that. 
I'm in it for the dog's health, not my opinions or feelings. And that's such a powerful statement only because we don't know what our dogs need or how much of anything that our dogs needs. All of it is a guesstimate. I honestly don't buy into the AFCO findings um, and their limited studies. I don't believe gray studies suffice as a true study. And by gray study, it's usually just a very limited study that's basically a few steps above someone's opinion on what should be done. And I believe that the NRC guidelines are outdated and need to be looked at again. And they need to be looked at based on various ways that we're feeding our dogs, kibble, cooked, raw, um, all of it, because all of it changes. And, um, you know, I think it's important that we keep an open mind because I think over time, as more and more pet parents start going towards fresh food, we're gonna see these giants start looking into fresh food. In fact, I got an email this morning that Purina purchased a UK company of um, <laughs> natural kibble um, and canned food. I don't really know how kibble can be natural. That's just my, okay. But still, it look, I've been wondering when Purina was gonna start buying into these brands that are offering a healthier option for, for pets because pet parents are demanding that. And I wouldn't be surprised, and I'm actually surprised that we haven't seen it already, um, Purina or Blue Buffalo or one of the other big brands um, buying a raw food company. And they may have and just bought it and shut it down. I don't know. Um, but um, I wouldn't be surprised. And so I think once big pet food starts getting involved and they actually see that they can make some real money from something, that's when I see they may have um, an interest in putting together a real study. The problem as it is today, I know that there are lots of small studies all around the world over the years, but a real study that veterinarians are gonna pay attention to um, is gonna have to be done by someone who has millions of dollars to put into that study, in my opinion. Um, because from what I understand from the people I spoke with, doing a study is expensive. And right now the raw food companies don't have the budget to do a study. And I just, again, my opinion, I don't see many raw food companies coming together and collaborating in an effective way, which would allow them to pull together money to do a study. I just think that right now there isn't a whole lot of trust because it is a business and you're expecting them to work with their competitors. Um, and it's kind of a hard pill to swallow that someone isn't a competitor, they're actually a colleague. It's just a different way of thinking. And But I think maybe someday we'll get there. Um, so uh, Diane says, you can't just say what I know is right, be open to learn new things. So very true. And Krista says, and Krista owns the um, company in Southern California, Vibrant Canine. If you're down there, check them out. If I could impart anything on anyone, it's that nobody knows what a dog needs nutritionally. We have good minimum values, but many, many holes in maximum. It's a chronic work and pro process, stay fluid. And Kathleen says, I hope not about my thought that Purina will buy a raw food company. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> so ultimately that comes down to like ending with the stay fluid that Krista says, it's important that we continue learning. So when it comes to feeding your dogs, I truly, truly believe that all of us will reach a point where we will just be feeding a little bit of the same thing if we really think about it. If 10 of us sat down and started going over what we were feeding their dogs, we would find that we're all doing it the same. We're probably just approaching it slightly differently and we're calling it different names. But if we actually broke down the ingredients that we were putting in a dog's diet um, or in their bowl, we would find that, you know, we're not too far off and there's going to be a model as, you know, um, Scott said, which is basically just feed the dog in front of you. I think that we're all doing a base of the same things. And then based on what a, one individual dog needs, we're adding additional stuff to cover that dog. And that's all it is to it. So if you are trying to learn about raw feeding, if you are very much interested in always continuing to learn, I'm gonna share what I'm doing. So I am a member of two raw feeding groups. The reason why I'm only a member of two raw feeding groups is because it is too overwhelming to me to be a member of all of them. 
I do not like raw feeding groups that limit information. So if a group is saying you are not allowed to discuss this person or share this person's articles, in my opinion, they're telling me that they're not open to new information. And that is not something that I'm willing to, to be a part of because I want to learn. Ultimately, if we're here for our dogs and cats, there's no room for ego. There's no room for suppressing information because you never know. Whoever is wrong today may be right tomorrow and vice versa. We're constantly learning. I mean, if you remember, if you guys have been around, seven years ago, we were arguing like to the death about vegetables. Friendships split up. There was a period of time when everyone loved Rodney. And then one day Rodney said, you know, vegetables are pretty good. They have antioxidants, they have new, and then all of a sudden the prey model community was like, oh, traitor, and boom, Rodney was on the outs with them. And, you know, there was a period of time when people thought coconut oil was sort of like um, voodoo, is just sort of like craziness. Why would you give your dog coconut oil? That makes absolutely zero sense. Whereas now people regularly add coconut oil, whether to their diet or they just use it with their dogs. Um, it's one of those things where things are fluid, things change. I don't wanna be part of a group that's going to shut down a line of information that's gonna ultimately help my dog. Coconut oil may not work for somebody's dog, but what if it does for my dog? I wanna have access to that information. That being said, that's why I always recommend Raw Feeding 101 and Raw Feeding University as groups to um, participate in. I'm more of a lurker nowadays. I don't often ask a lot of questions, but I do find value in the discussions that are happening, whether it be someone who's brand new to raw feeding or someone who's been around for a long time, I have found value in the information that's being shared in the groups. And I find the groups to be very open-minded and not um, mean. Um, you can do meal formulation. So. I recommend this to people who are brand new and feeling overwhelmed and they're doing the, I don't know what to feed my dog and what supplement is gonna balance the diet. It's just sort of like, okay, let's stop. You can either trust me that your dog is gonna be okay, or you can start with um, a meal, having a meal formulated. So Dr. Lori Kozier offers meal formulation. Um, Scott J. Marshall offers meal formulation through Raw Feeding 101. And um, Ronnie Lejeune offers meal formulation through Perfectly Rawsome. So you can pay someone to, they can create one recipe for you. They can create a, a list of recipes for you. They can do it based on what you have access to and um, help you work it through your budget. It's a valuable service and it's something that you can invest in. I do not offer meal formulation services despite the fact that I have um, the animal diet formulator on my computer. I think it is an awesome program, although um, it's very overwhelming and every recipe that I have created has too many ingredients in it. And I honestly do not understand having 15, 20, 25 ingredients in one bowl. I just don't think it's necessary. So this is why I don't offer meal formulation services because I can't stand by the meals. It's not to say that the meals are wrong. It's just to say that I don't think the average person is going to go shopping and spend the money that they need to spend to make that meal for their dogs on a daily basis. So, um, but if there are people who basically have a lot more experience doing it um, have a lot more knowledge about what needs to be done, what can be replaced with what. And that's why I direct you to people who have that type of um, knowledge base, not me. Um, you can also look at books. There's tons and tons. I wish if I had them, I have books. If you go and look in my office, see that shelf? Tons and tons of books about um, raw feeding. There's so many out there, it's not even funny. If you just go to a raw feeding group and say, what book do you recommend? People will tell you what group that they recommend, what books they recommend. And so I'm not gonna tell you what book to buy if you wanna learn about raw feeding because I think it's important for you to figure out what book you need if you wanna you know, learn about raw feeding. But there's a lot of books out there. Um, and finally, there are um, courses. There's Raw Feeding 101. Dogs Naturally Magazine is offering their raw feeding course for free. Um, I think that if you are gonna take a course, Try and keep an open mind. And by this, don't allow the course to make you turn into like, I have to feed this way. 
I think Scott's course is more open-minded because Scott himself is more open-minded. The Dogs Naturally Magazine course, I haven't taken yet, but I know that as a magazine, they tend to have very um, strict ideas on what is right and wrong, which is okay. But I am hesitant to um, adopt that only because just because this is right and wrong for them doesn't mean that it's right or wrong for my dog, if that makes sense. So that's why I say always keep an open mind because the second you close down, you're going to get a dog that's going to make you question everything that you thought was true. I got that with Apollo. He's teaching me a lot of new things. And finally, um, if you are fortunate, you might have a pro raw um, veterinarian or animal nutritionist in your area who can help you get started. Um, another thing, Dr. Lori Kozier, she does offer consultations as well. And um, so there's a lot of ref resources out there that can help you. Um, Hillary says, I don't think Purina could profit enough from a raw diet for their liking. I don't think so either, but I wouldn't put it down for um, in the future. I just, you know, as people build and build and build as our community grows, I mean, we're just seeing so many people who are really interested in feeding a healthier diet. Um, Scott says, I think the funniest part of all of it is that there are really very different few differences between the different models and method. It mostly comes down to amounts and a few ingredients. And I completely agree. <laughs> Diane says, oh dear God, don't start Cocoa Gate again. And that's my coconut oil. It's, oh, it's great. It's been a fun, it's been fun to follow that. Um, Krista says, gotta run. Um, bath water is cold. I guess I didn't need to say that out loud. See ya, Krista. <laughs> um, Janet says, I feel nutrition is ever evolving science. Look at human nutrition. First we ate butter, then butter was bad, then margarine was good, now terrible. On and on it goes. Don't eat eggs, the incredible edible egg, ever changing opinions based on science and how that model affects health. Yes, yes, yes. Well said, Janet. So to wrap this up, I wanted to just add why I add vegetables and why I add supplements, because this is a question that I often get. And I have been kicked out of so many groups because of this. This is a stance that I, um, it hasn't changed much, like the idea of adding vegetables and supplements to my dog's diet. It's just become more specific to my dogs, which means that I'm very, um, I have a very strict rule on what I'm doing in that I don't just buy any old supplement and add it to my dog's diet. And guess what? I'm saving a ton of money with that attitude. So vegetables, I said it earlier, I add them for fiber. I add them to feed the microbiome of the gut. I add them for the antioxidants. I mean, how much antioxidants my, they add to my dog's diet, I don't really know, but there's some in there. I add them for um, additional nutrients. I add them for, uh, la, 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 la. I guess that's it. Yeah, anyway, there's a question about, you know, are they digestible? Can dogs um, process them and absorb those nutrients? Uh, I puree, puree the vegetables or I ferment the vegetables. And so the idea is that you're supposed to break the cellular wall to make the nutrients and everything else more bioavailable to our dogs. And so I've just done that out of habit. And I've also gotten into the habit of, I was gonna say something and I completely lost my mind or lost my train of thought. So let's go back and just say that um, the idea that dogs don't have enough, I believe it's amylase to break down carbs or vegetables, I don't think is exactly accurate. Um, I do think dogs do have amylase. I sure as hell know Rodrigo does because he tests it for it on his blood work and I'm adding more of it to his diet through, um, an enzyme supplement. But I do think my dogs do break down the vegetables when I puree them and they're getting the benefits of them. I don't know if vegetables would, you know, balance a diet. And the reason why is because I really don't know how much, for instance, broccoli my dogs would need. Would they need, you know, two cups of broccoli to get whatever nutrients broccoli brings to the table or do they need a truckload of broccoli? I really don't know. I think it really depends on the dog and how they're digesting the food. And the best example, again, is Rodrigo because of his um, EPI or 
exocrine pancreatic insufficiency and his inability to digest food on his own, he um, has a limited way of absorbing nutrients as compared to my other dogs. And the way I'm fixing that is through an enzyme supplement so that it pre-digests the food for him and then he eats it and he can gain the benefits of the nutrients. So there's many questions out there. So if I have all these questions, why do I still add vegetables? Because regardless of all of that, it's still a great source of fiber and it still feeds the microbiome, making the gut healthier, which in turn makes the immune system stronger. So the other thing is why do I add supplements? I add supplements because there are things that are missing from my dog's diet. Mostly the supplements I add are whole food supplements and they are alternatives to foods. So for instance, for omega-3 fatty acids, I would prefer to add whole sardines. And if you've seen a real sardine, not the canned ones, but the, they're like this big, they're nice. I recently lost my source for sardines by buy OC Raw. Um, it's not that OC Raw is going away, it's just not accessible to me anymore. So I used to buy it by the case from OC Raw and um, now I don't do that. So I alternate between salmon oil and fermented fish stock and I'm going to um, start doing fermented fish stock exclusively only because I don't like the idea of the oxida oxidation of salmon oil. So once you open it, it goes bad fast because it's been exposed to air. I just rather do fermented fish stock. It's just easier. So that's where my dogs get their omega-3 fatty acids. So not your typical supplement. We usually think of pills and powders. It's a whole food supplement. Um, another thing that I add to my dog's diet is a vitamin B supplement. And the reason why is because when I had my dog's nutrient tested a year ago, one of the things that came back was that they were all slightly low in vitamin B. So I do add pork hearts to their diet, which is a rich source of vitamin B, but I alternate that with a vitamin B supplement in the case that I haven't thawed out pork hearts or just don't have them on hand. And then two other supplements that I add to my dog's diet um, are glandular support. Um, Mercula has one for females, one for males. And so I add that to my dog's diet because they don't, I don't have a really good source of gland um, organ meat. So I'm adding that supplement to their diet to cover the glands. And believe it or not, it does do some benefits to our dogs as far as, you know, with Sydney, it's really great for her arthritis is adding that supplement to her dog. I, it's on top of other supplements, but it's a really great supplement for that. Um, and then finally, I'm adding a mushroom complex to the d bowl for two dogs, my senior dogs, because the mushrooms are said to help prevent cancer. And since 50% of our dogs are going to come down with cancer and that goes up with senior dogs, I want my dogs covered. Now, outside of the bowl, I also give my dogs joint supplements. Two of my dogs have arthritis, so they also get um, canine system saver and then they get WinPro Mobility. And then my younger dogs, all three of them, even Apollo starting today, are on Cosequin DS Plus with MSM that I just get from Costco. So Apollo gets one pill a day. Um, Zoe gets two pills, two um, tab caps, tablets, tablets a day. And then Scout gets three. Why the different amounts? Apollo, because he's still young and has that yummy, healthy, you know, joints and everything is going great. So I'm just starting him on I'm getting that support. Zoe, because um, two tablets is what's recommended for her size. Scout, because he is crazy, super active, running, jumping and everything. And I wanna make sure that he has the support that he needs. And does the bottle say these things? No, I just make it up as I go. And it makes me feel good because that's how I roll. So thank you guys for um, joining me today. Tomorrow, we have another one. Let me see if I can find the... Uh, you know what, it, I would have been smart if I would have had it, I had it up on my screen yesterday. So I can tell you what we're talking about tomorrow. And tomorrow is sourcing and budgeting. So that means this is like a really fun topic because I'm gonna talk to you about how I was able to get my budget down to on average $300 a month for five dogs and one cat. Um, I usually don't count my cat in that $300 a month, but I can because you know, spoiler alert, I buy crazy in bulk. And I'm gonna tell you how you can do that even if you don't belong to a raw food co-op. So thank you again for um, 
joining me today. I want to read this because Scott says, yep, I feed veggies daily. I blend them until they are almost liquefied and I know there's nothing green coming out the other end. Amylase not being present in dogs definitely needs to be on a raw feeding myths list. Um, Janet says, Dr. Peter Tobias says not to feed fruit at the same time as meat protein. Any thoughts on that? That's a great question. And so the idea of it is that, um, isn't it just that, you know, when it's sitting in the gut, it'll start to ferment and that will lead to stomach upset. I actually haven't had any type of issues with it because it's not like when I'm feeding my dogs, I'm adding a cup of blueberries or blackberries to the bowl. The times that I've added fruit to their bowl, it's been because I went blackberry picking or blueberry picking and I had a few in a bowl. So I just sprinkled two or three over the bowl. My dogs don't have an issue. I do feed fruit to my dogs in the summertime. We have an orchard here. Um, and by orchard, I mean, we have two apple trees, a peach tree and about three plum trees. So not quite an orchard, but that's what we call it. And um, so I will dehydrate the apples. Um, the dogs don't eat the plums because of the seed. And um, the dogs don't eat the peaches because usually my sister-in-law, if we have a good year, will come and get the peaches and make peach wine. So it's apples and I will dehydrate the apples and give them to my dogs as treats. And sometimes I'll go outside with a switchblade and cut up the apples to get the core out and the dogs will eat the apples as they're laying around outside. It's never part of their meal. So um, I would speak to, I would ask that question in a raw feeding group if you are curious um, about what the ramifications are. And I, cause, and the reason why I say in a raw feeding group is that I find that it's better to get different people's perspective of what they are experiencing with their dogs rather than um, what one expert says. And it's not that you should discount the expert. Peter Tobias is brilliant. It's just that sometimes it's more realistic to talk to people who are doing what you're doing. And so um, Emily says, I buy krill oil pump from NWC Naturals. It doesn't go rancid because it's in an airless pump. Nice. Mushrooms are good for the immune system. That's Janet and Belinda says, have a great evening. Be careful and safe. You guys be careful and safe too. Stay home, avoid people six feet apart. Um, we will get through this together. Thank you guys for joining me for another day. Tomorrow again is all about budgeting. Talk to you later.